Okay, everybody, welcome to the next webinar for Core 3. Today we're very lucky to have Jean-Sébastien Delille joining us. Jean-Sébastien works with Project 5, and in a nutshell, he works on antiviral T-cell responses. Uh, Dr. Delille is a transplant hematologist who uh, he completed his PhD in transplantation immunology, and since 2010, he's been working as a staff hematologist and a principal investigator at the Maison Neuve Rosemont Hospital, and is an assistant professor at the Université de Montréal. His lab focuses on basic and translational T cell biology. More specifically, he works on the signals and mechanisms that dictate T cell differentiation and memory effector development. These studies feed an active translational program in clinical adoptive immunotherapy, where Dr. Delille devises and implements clinical grade ex vivo culture systems to generate cellular immunotherapy products. He's currently supervising or co-supervising two T cell adoptive immunotherapy clinical studies directly derived from his work. And he's going to be talking to us today about T cell immunity, and his talk is a tough time to fight the struggle of T cell immunity following transplantation. So with a last reminder to make sure that if you've called in on your telephone, to make sure that your phone is on mute and your computer speaker is on mute, we'll turn the floor over to Dr. Delille and we'll take questions towards the end. Thank you very much for this uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, I apologize if some of you think that the title sounds like an action movie, but uh, this is the best I, I could find. So um, a lot of this work, if not most of this work, especially at the end, is supported uh, through the uh, CNTRP, um, a program that was initially a uh, project that was initially launched by a CNTRP uh, Astellis uh, grant. And I am glad here to share uh, not only the data, but also the uh, key questions that surround T cell immunity um, in uh, transplantation. So I recognize that not all of you are immunologists, so the, um, the uh, introduction will be uh, fairly, uh, fairly broad. Uh, so um, if, uh, if I bore you, well, uh, I'm sorry. So uh, the objective, so the, what I would like you to take away from this uh, webinar is to understand how the various components of the immune system recognize pathogens, so that's Immuno 101. Uh, recognize the principal virus-related complications in transplantation, understand the current and emerging approaches to enhance immunoreconstitution post-transplant, which is a topic mostly relevant to um, hematopoietic cell transplantation with interesting corollaries in the SOT world um, as well. So um, in transplantation, T cells are the bad guy. Uh, however, they are not always the bad guys, obviously, um, despite the fact that all our um, pharmacological agents uh, aim at suppressing T cells, they mediate uh, important uh, functions even in transplantation uh, patients. So um, uh, um, transplant patients are, are very vulnerable to, um, to uh, infections. Uh, because we non-specifically inhibit their uh, T cell function. Um, it must be also included, and although I, I really want things to be as T cell centric as possible for, for, the, for the, the, the sake of, of clarity, uh, the immune system is far more complex than that, and immunosuppressants such, such as steroids can have an impact on many other cells as well. Transplant patients are usually patients who have a long medical history, uh, patients who have been dealing with autoimmunity or malignancy. Uh, they have been immunosuppressed in the past and may be colonized with all sorts of um, opportunistic um, infections. So um, the uh, ultimate goal would be to perform transplantation uh, by inducing immune tolerance, so tolerance to the transplanted organ or transplanted to the host tissues in the case of bone marrow transplant. But um, this is very clearly a non-achieved goal at the present time. There are several uh, investigators in the CNTRP uh, who deal with this question. But um, it is not uh, 
it is not tomorrow that we will see a, a, uh, a protocol that will uh, work on the basis of full uh, operational tolerance in organ or cell transplantation. So um, if I can put the immune system on one slide, you see on the left side the uh, innate immunity, which is made of myeloid effectors, neutrophils, uh, macrophages mostly, um, that will, uh, in fact, attack very rapidly bacteria and parasites. On the other uh, side, on the right side, you see the adaptive immune system, which uh, is best known to target viruses. This is especially true for T cells and uh, other pathogens, uh, B cells through the secretion of antibodies, are very important in our fight against uh, bacteria uh, as well, and, and parasites uh, in, um, to a large extent. So um, obviously the immune system is far more complex than what is depicted here. You can see here that some uh, cells share a characteristic of both. Uh, so gamma delta T cells and NK cells are lymphoid cells that really act as a uh, immune, innate, uh, innate uh, effector. So um, it is said that innate immunity is the first line of defense. It acts very fast, and that adaptive immunity is a slow response, which is obviously not true. Some uh, memory cells can be uh, extremely uh, rapid, especially those that uh, reside in tissues. So what perhaps distinguishes um, the two systems very well is that um, the innate immune system recognizes danger signals, so molecular patterns or stress uh, signals that indicate that something is wrong. So in a way, they prime the immune system. They just indicate, oh, something is very wrong, for, uh, and set the table for recognition of very specific molecular pattern called antigens by B and T cells. The uh, adaptive immune system um, has memory potential. There's a debate, perhaps, um, uh, innate cells, notably natural killer cells, can have memory as well. But um, the uh, key to, uh, to, to know here is that T cells and B cells will provide long-term immunity to uh, people after an initial infection or after vaccination. So this is how a, a primary immune response occurs. You have, at the beginning, a, a state of quiescence where uh, T or B cells are uh, kept in uh, uh, of, in standstill, um, and after antigen contact and appropriate activi activation signal, you get a program of proliferation, differentiation, and activation, which will increase, uh, here I put T cell, T cell number and function. Um, these T cells will remove antigens, so kill the infected cells, and most of them will die through a process of apoptosis uh, during a phase that we call contraction. A very tiny minority will persist as memory cells and will be ready to fight the antigen once it's come back. Um, the T cells, are the once activated, are the fastest growing or dividing cells in the human body uh, and can divide in just four hours. So you can have, during a few days, uh, a several thousand-fold expansion of antigen-specific T cells. If you don't remove the antigen, what happens is that you overactivate the system and you develop in uh, existing T cells exhaustion and dysfunction. This is well characterized in chronic viral infections such as uh, hepatitis B, C, or HIV, and uh, is also uh, the case in um, uh, cancer, and uh, probably also in uh, transplantation just as well. So what are the signals that will dictate a, a strong um, adaptive um, immune response? So uh, you can complain about the quality of the drawing. They are from me. So uh, the, um, 
dendritic cell that you see here, which is the blue cell, uh, can do two major things. It can present antigen to the um, MHC, in English, major histocompatibility complex, to the T cell, which has a TCR, a T cell receptor, but it also incorporates through other receptors. It samples the environment for danger signals. And when there's a danger signal, it's, it tells the cell that the antigen it presents is likely from an offender of some sort. So it uh, pushes the dendritic cell to secrete stimulatory cytokines, represented by one of the green arrows there, and express co-stimulatory molecules that will be uh, recognized through cell-cell contact by receptors present on the T cell. Here is depicted the interaction between CD80 or 86 and CD28. Hence, T cell immunity is based on the three, the three signal model. One is antigen recognition, which, also, which basically uh, confirms that the signal is foreign. Signal two, co-stimulation, which is the translation of a danger context. And signal three is cytokines, cytokines that can be produced by the T cells themselves or the antigen present, presenting cell. So <clears throat> the T cells are the architect of the, uh, the adaptive immune, immune response. They will, um, and I'm going to go relatively fast over this because this should be known to most of you. So once a T cell is uh, prime, it will also interact with B cell, B cells that, have, um, that will present the same antigen as dendritic cells and will receive a signal from the T cells to uh, activate, uh, proliferate, and differentiate into either memory B cells or plasma blasts, which are the um, uh, antibody secreting cells. The interaction of the specialized T cells that are um, form after this primary antigen encounter to stimulate B cells, the T follicular helper, TFH cells, will secrete cytokines such as IL-21 to stimulate the, uh, the B cells and uh, send important signals to the uh, B cells through cell-cell um, uh, contact the most known, the best known of these interactions is CD40 ligand and CD40, which will send a strong activation signal to the B cell. So you can see here that the adaptive immune system is well coordinated so that um, T cells that remain the architect of the response uh, will, um, will um, launch uh, T cells. Uh, cellular immunity through T cells, so that will result in direct uh, attack of infected cells, and also it will um, stimulate humoral immunity, which is the secretion of these uh, antibodies. In fact, in transplantation, the, these reactions are uh, both required. Um, acute rejection, um, can be cellular, so mediated by T cell, or humoral, medi mediated by uh, pathogenic uh, antibodies. So in my uh, field of predilection, uh, bone marrow transplantation, uh, T cells uh, mediate, will react against uh, foreign antigens, and I will describe that in better detail. They will be stimulated by a, um, also a um, cytokine-rich media because uh, after transplantation, we see damaged tissue from chemotherapy and radiotherapy. As SOT patients will have damaged tissue from the transplanted organ and the surgery itself, this will prime donor T cells that will either directly attack tissues or stimulate myeloid effector, you see here the dotted gray line with in, in ENF gamma, which is interferon gamma, that will stimulate the macrophages that will also uh, mediate uh, inflammatory damage in target tissues. So in BMT, it's the graft that attacks the host, 
predominantly in the skin, liver, and intestine. So how do we deal with this? And that applies to both uh, solid organ and uh, hematopoietic cell transplantation. We put the brakes on T cell activation because we know that T cells can directly mediate um, damage. They will stimulate myeloid effectors and they will stimulate B cells. So it is very reasonable to stop T cell activation, which we do relatively effectively. So if you see here the adaptive uh, immune response, as I uh, schematically represented it, <coughs> you have steroids or anti-thymocyte glomulin that can destroy the T cells even when they are quiescent and not, um, and not activated. It will, can also and destroy or, or kill relatively effectively T cells that have reached their full effector potential at the peak of the response. But this is not what we use commonly for long-term immunosuppression because these are extremely toxic in the long run. What we want to stop basically with immunopharmacology is this upslope here where T cells get activated. So we target the T cell uh, signaling machinery through calcineurin inhibitors. Calcineurin uh, is the, uh, in fact, the, the mediator of uh, calcium signaling in, in T cells, leading to the nuclear translocation of the uh, nuclear factor of activated T cell uh, family of transcription factors, which will um, stimulate, in the context of other signals, T cell activation. The nucleotide analog, uh, MMF or mycophenolate, as a thiopin and methotrexate, MTX, will directly inhibit the uh, DNA synthesis of these highly proliferating T cells. Uh, Anti-IL-2 antibodies can also uh, uh, cut short the um, upslope of T cell activation by blocking the um, main uh, vitamin or the main uh, uh, mitogen of activated T cells, which is IL-2. Rapamycin is a drug that can directly inhibit cell cycle and also inhibit the uh, effector metabolic reprogramming of T cell, which will also inhibit T cells as they get activated. These drugs are probably useless once the um, uh, response at, has reached a, a peak of um, after, after responding to the uh, alloantigens. So what are these alloantigens? Um, alloreactivity is based on the recognition by T cells of foreign antigens. So T cells recognize antigens through its TCR, T cell receptor, and in the context of MHC, major histocompatibility complex, or in human HLA, major histocompatibility um, um, uh, human leukocyte antigens. And these are in, in now a relatively old terminology, still called major histocompatibility antigen. So if you mismatch a T cell and a responder cell and a target cell, uh, through the HLA, you can have a very vigorous immune response. So much so that in hematopoietic cell transplantation, we want to match for uh, HLA between donor and recipient. And in this case, the alloreactivity is through peptides that are presented to the T cells, peptides that derive from the normal proteome of the host, um, which uh, will uh, reflect uh, through polymorphism the very subtle difference between a donor and a recipient. And these small peptides that represent genetically encoded differences between donor and recipient, except ident identical twins, obviously, are called minor histocompatibility uh, antigen. So this is the fundamental uh, reaction that we uh, want to block. Unfortunately, this is also the reaction that will um, favor or uh, um, permit the uh, response of T cells against um, viruses and pathogens. 
So, what is the impact of immunosuppression on pathogen-specific responses? So, if you prevent these primary responses, and this is particularly relevant for defense against new infections. So, I have to say that the field of post-transplant infection is much more diversified in pediatrics than in adults because pediatric patients uh, have, uh, have to develop immunity against uh, new uh, pathogens all the time. It also has an impact on seronegative patients. The seronegative patients are these patients who have never seen a pathogen before, so they have not developed antibodies against it, okay? So once they receive an infection through the organ or uh, through the environment, it's extremely hard for them to mount an efficient primary response while they are under immunosuppression. If the patient have already a repertoire against uh, these uh, pathogens, so the, if they have memory responses and antibodies uh, against these uh, uh, pathogens, they will be much less affected by um, immunosuppression as it is easier to mount a secondary, so a memory response, as opposed to a primary response. So here you can, this is, uh, for those of you who like drawings, this is exactly what I said in image. So uh, you can see how complicated is a primary response with m migration and the involvement of many cells that need to proliferate and be uh, coordinately um, uh, activated. While in the memory phase, you see that the effectors are sort of pre-made. So what the antigen challenge uh, comes back uh, you can see here that the uh, antibody response and the T cell response uh, is uh, mounted much more rapidly and much more effectively as, as reflected uh, by the, um, by the uh, curves in blue at, on, the, um, right, uh, pa on the right side panels. Why is this different? And I won't uh, go uh, in too much details about that, but um, it mostly has to do with the fact that after a primary response, the T and B cells will reshape their chromatin so that gene expression for activation is much easier. So the chrom chromatin is, um, becomes permissive does not require as much uh, signal to um, initiate uh, gene uh, transcription. So um, the uh, other piece of, of other significant piece of, of information here uh, regarding memory cells is that uh, when a patient receives a transplant, if he or she has uh, preformed antibodies to fight infections it will take time before these antibodies wane away. The half-life of an antibody is about 21 days. And uh, for the short time after transplantation, these pre-made antibodies uh, can uh, have a significant uh, importance in protecting the patient. So in summary for this uh, Immuno 101 uh, primer, Transplant immunology is very T cell centric still, but the entire immune system contributes to allo responses. So if you knock off the T cell arm of the immune system, you will affect several other cells that are uh, relevant to um, immune responses. However, and this is why T cell immunology is particularly deficient in uh, transplant patients. What is most particular of transplant patients is that they will suffer from viral infection, which depends very highly on uh, a good T cell immunity. So here is a very busy slide. So you can see uh, that's from up to date, so available to most of you. Um, you can see the timeline of infection in solid organ transplantation or on the right here, uh, hematopoietic cell transplantation. So what you can see if we stay on the right side for the, the sake of time, the principles are, are similar.
So what you see here is that during the pre-engraftment, so after the patient has received chemotherapy and we are waiting for the graft to take, really, and produce new cells, you have a high, heightened um, vulnerability to um, uh, bacterial infections. So once the neutrophils come back, you see here that you are, you're much, the patients are much less subject to develop bacterial infections unless you, you see very fine defects, and even you can see that late after transplant in antibody-producing cells and also T cells, revealing a, 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 a vulnerability to encapsulated bacteria. This is the reason why we um, vaccinate patients uh, as aggressively as we can after, after transplant to stimulate this uh, immunity, which never, never goes back to normal. So you can see that for viral infections, we, we see trends as well, where um, some viruses will occur uh, during the first year of transplant at any time, while others will occur at more um, later time points. This is notably the, uh, the case for EBV PTLD, uh, so PTLD post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, EBV Epstein-Barr virus. The reason why it occurs later after transplant is that you need a, um, a reconstitution of donor-derived type cells that carry the virus uh, to, uh, to, be, uh, to be at risk. The uh, other threat is uh, fungal infection, which can occur at various time points. So you can see that candida occurs during periods of neutropenia, while pneumocystis will occur later on in a uh, case of, um, of T cell uh, disimmunity. This vulnerability to infection is influenced by the type of immunosuppression you give, and also graft versus host disease, which can uh, affect your secondary lymphoid organ and your thymus. So, I mean, these are details, but um, it is important to know that the tempo of immune reconstitution will dictate your, the vulnerabilities of the, the patients. So, this is the tempo of immuno reconstitution. You can see here that um, after uh, transplantation, the innate immunity bounces back very quickly, while um, T cells that depend from the thymus, so a stem cell that will migrate to the thymus and produce a new T cell, that takes time. Immunoglobulins also take time, as B cell reconstitution tends to be rather slow. What can occur relatively rapidly are T cells derived from the graft. So the T cells that were actually in the bag of the graft can uh, expand through a process called homeostatic uh, expansion and protect patients against um, infectious threats. But this, this rapid surge in T cell is actually responsible for graft versus O disease, so we tend to immunosuppress the patients very severely the during the first three months after transplant. So what are the infectious threats? Um, in uh, bone marrow transplant, AHCT stands for allogenic hematopoietic cell transplantation. Um, CMV is probably our um, greatest nightmare still. Uh, CMV is present in one half of the population. It's a latent virus, uh, so it can reactivate in the case of immunosuppression. Uh, it can cause deadly pneumonitis, colitis, and hepatitis. Um, we have a preemptive strategy that I will describe. So it is monitored, and we try to treat with antiviral as soon as we see uh, EBV, uh, CMV reactivating. EBV Epstein-Barr virus can uh, reactivate and cause post-transplant lymphoproliferative, lymphoproliferative disorder. Relatively low incidence overall, but uh, increasingly seen in protocols that require more intense immunosuppression. Um, HSV, herpes simplex virus, is a uh, constant, uh, a constant uh, threat. 
in kids mostly HHV6, human herpes virus 6 and adenovirus can be uh, extremely uh, severe, uh, sometimes deadly. Uh, PML, GC virus, uh, PML, so um, um, they, it causes a brain infection, an infection of the white matter that can uh, kill patients or leave a very important neurological sequelae. BK virus in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation manifests itself as um, cystitis, uh, which can be extremely annoying but not deadly. Varicella zoster will cause shingles or disseminated uh, um, zona, which is a, a, a tough to treat. And which, what we should keep in mind is that these patients, like everybody else, are entitled to get those respiratory viruses that we all get, influenza, RSV. It can be extremely severe in these patients, um, pediatrics notably, where uh, these uh, respiratory viruses can, can, can actually kill an immunosuppressed patient. In the solid organ transplant world, it's about the same things, but the pattern is different. So um, EBV will cause PTLD with a different pattern, and sometimes uh, at a higher frequency, especially in combined uh, transplants, intestinal transplant, combined heart and lungs. Um, CMV can be a problem uh, in some instances, perhaps not as much as in stem cell transplantation. Adenovirus is rarely life-threatening, but BK virus, which uh, infects the, um, the graft um, in kidney transplantation, can actually ruin the transplantation. So this is a, a serious complication following uh, renal transplantation. So how is this addressed uh, in everyday clinical practice? We use PCR assays now, which can detect in bodily fluids uh, minute amounts of the viruses. Uh, unfortunately, most of these assays are not standardized between centers, which means that a viral load of 10,000 here doesn't mean that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the same degree of reactivation than a viral load at 10,000 somewhere else. Uh, there's an effort to uh, standardize uh, CMV testing um, mostly. And what do we do for Epstein-Barr virus? I told you that patients who are seronegative, so who do not have pre-existing immunity against the virus, are more susceptible to develop complications. This is very true in a solid organ transplant, where EBV seronegative recipients, especially at our center, might not be like this everywhere, will be monitored very closely because most of them are getting EBV through the graft. In um, hematopoietic cell transplantation, we uh, monitor EBV in alternative transplants, so uh, haploidentical cords, so these, these uh, haploidentical transplants, these transplants are half match on the HLA, so you need very intense immunosuppression or even removing the T cells from the graft. So these patients are extremely immunosuppressed. Cord blood, uh, the patients will receive an, Im an immature immune system, obviously all naive that hasn't seen any, uh, any bug before. So um, these patients are highly susceptible. Patients who receive anti-thymocyte globulin, ATG, will be at high risk of developing uh, EBV-related complications, or at least reactivations. Um, cytomegalovirus, um, we uh, tend to treat, uh, to, to monitor every donor or recipient that, well, any patient whose donor is positive or any recipient who is positive in more self. Um, once uh, it re it CMV reactivates, we have drugs. Well, for Epstein-Barr virus, we don't have drugs, but we can wipe out the natural reservoir of EBV, which is the B cells, with an antibody directed against uh, the cell surface protein CD20 called rituximab. Adenovirus, which is not a big nightmare in SOT, can be a very, very 
uh, bad uh, infection in uh, stem cell transplantation, but we restrict our monitoring to alternative uh, donors, cords or aplos. BK virus, we use PCR-based IC to make a diagnosis. So when the, the um, symptoms of cystitis are present, are, are present, and if it is positive, well, we tend to play with immunosuppression or use a drug called sidofovir, and that does not work very well. Uh, there are variations on sidofovir that work a bit better, but these drugs are not always accessible. In kidney transplantation, BK virus monitoring is routine, and when it reactivates, the reaction is to uh, lower immunosuppression or change uh, immunosuppressive uh, regimes. So what are the strategies to, immune, to increase immune reconstitution in, um, I will speak mostly for stem cell transplantation. As a, in SOT, we can talk of immune suppression, but immune reconstitution is, 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 a, is a concept that, is more dif that can be applied with more difficulty to these patients. So plan the transplant well. So in stem cell transplant, you need to cho choose the donor, you need to, cho to choose the property regimen, the type of immunosuppression you're going to give, and all of this can be planned in advance. Eventually, you want to wean off immunosuppression. Uh, obviously, you want to avoid Graves versus O's disease, which can uh, compromise your, um, your immunity even further. And uh, also, you need to, to prepare well in advance a vaccination schedule uh, that will, um, in fact, help the patients reconstitute their immunity against common pathogens. More experimental are um, assays using cytokines or hormones to protect the thymus or regenerate the thymus. Um, some people have tried sex steroid deprivation to help the uh, time to preserve thymic function, um, but no, we have not castrated anyone. Uh, this is highly experimental still, and the efficacy is debatable. So, the other one that is experimental and the one I work on are cell therapies. So. Cell therapies uh, can be timing dependent. So what you, you, you do is you give lymphoid precursors and you hope that, that the thymus will differentiate them into functional lymphoid cells. Interesting strategy. I work more on the timing independent side where I actually take mature T cells, I manipulate them ex vivo, I expand them, and I re-inject them into people. So, Adoptive T cell immunotherapy can come from the original donor in uh, stem cell transplantation, can come from the patient itself, or it can come from a third party donor, which means a donor that's not of the graph and not the patient, but that is partially matched to the uh, recipient. So, um, this requires a bit of ex vivo manipulation. So our first um, protocol involves the priming of uh, EBV-specific T cells. So we, we use a peripheral blood mononuclear uh, cells that we stimulate with a peptide pool uh, in a culture device called JREX, which is a special bioreactor um, that favors gas exchange um, uh, at the level of the cell layer. Uh, and we use a cocktail of cytokine composed of IL-7 and IL-4. We uh, grow the cells to clinical grade level, and we assess for antigen specificity. Antigen specificity is assessed uh, primarily through LE spot, and there's an example here where we use a two negative control, cells only or an irrelevant peptide library. The uh, relevant peptide libraries you want to target, so in this uh, in this case, the antigenic libraries of EBV, EB, EBNA1 and LMP2, and the anti-CD3 is a positive control. So each dot here is technically a cell that has secreted interferon gamma. If you um, use these cells on, um, on uh, targets that present the antigens, 
you get a uh, cell lysis that is a proportional to the amount of effectors uh, that you put in the milieu, and that's on the right-hand side. You can see here the white bars where allogenic mismatched cells, HLA mismatched cells, are not lysed by these cells, indicating that they don't have non-specific alloreactivity. Uh, so some of you might have seen this before, but this is the first patient we uh, treated. Um, so 31-year-old man who, uh, who had received a transplant for acute lymphoblastic leukemia 10 month, uh, 15 months prior to the infusion. He developed uh, PTLD, uh, refractory to rituximab, and chemotherapy. There were two sites, in the sinus and in the lung. The sinus was de dealt with with radiotherapy, but he had multiple pulmonary nodules. So we injected him using uh, his original donor. Uh, we saw an increase in the, um, in the nodules two weeks after infusion, and also the reactivation of his EBV viral load. So we said, okay, that's it. Uh, it doesn't work. But um, what, we, what we saw with, after this blimp of EBV reactivation is in the peripheral blood, we saw uh, evidence of EBV-specific immunity being, uh, being, uh, be, being present. This gradually translated in the complete resolution of the lung nodules, which were refractory to rituximab and chemotherapy. The patient is more than one year off uh, infusion, completely lymphoma-free now. We have treated uh, four other patients in other settings. We are treating solid organ transplant patients as well. This is a feasibility trial, so um, most patients uh, are toxicity trial, safety trial, and no uh, adverse events have been, have been seen. So, um, most lately, and I will finish with this, this is the work by Caroline Lamarche, a proud core 3 uh, trainee uh, now uh, in Megan Levin's lab, who completed this work um, in my lab before she left. So she's a nephrologist and wanted to treat uh, BK uh, virus reactivation in renal transplant patients. So. We are all infected by BK, so we always stimulate a memory repertoire. However, BK antigens, for reasons that are unclear to us, do not stimulate very well T cells in ex vivo. So even in uh, healthy control or kidney transplant patients, we have difficulty to reliably generate enough cells uh, to treat, uh, to treat uh, a patient. So, we added dendritic cells to increase the uh, quality of the antigen presentation, as I showed you earlier, T cells that are mature to express all the uh, necessary receptors and cytokines. And we were able to obtain on all kidney transplant patients who were actively viremic at the time of blood sampling, uh, T cell lines uh, that would be sufficient to uh, treat them eventually. These T cells uh, responded to VP1 and LTA, uh, which are BK-specific antigens in a fairly specific manner, and the presence of dendritic cells increased the specificity uh, of, the, of the response. We were able to show that these cells do not cause, uh, do not lyse uh, allogenic uh, targets and kill targets, but only targets that present um, the uh, antigenic peptides. When we injected these cells in immunodeficient mice, what happens is that if you use, um, if you use unmanipulated T cells, you see a rapid demise of the, uh, of the mice that also come to Graf versus O's disease because human T cells recognize mouse tissue as foreign and attack them. This is reflected with, uh, with the arrows indicate um, liver infiltrates and, and skin Graf versus O's disease, while T cell lines do not induce Graf versus O's disease. So this is not because the T cell that we manipulate ex vivo do not survive in the mice. On the contrary, 
they are able to proliferate, as shown by uh, BRDU um, incorporation experiments, and also counts uh, in the periphery where we can see that in all mice tested, um, some more than others, there was an increase in the human T cells recovered between uh, week three and uh, week six after, uh, after infusion. So to close this um, uh, webinar, uh, there are, with immunotherapy, uh, a lot of promise, but a lot of remaining challenge. We hope we'll be able to eventually launch a trial to treat uh, BK virus um, reactivating patients. Uh, but this may take a lot of time to translate our protocol into a um, clinical-grade manufacturing process, which is one of the limitations of adoptive immunotherapy. You need expertise and facilities to um, make these, um, these therapies uh, accessible. Um, we uh, have to expand to other viruses and other opportunistic pathogens, which is partly feasible based on our own work and work of others. The seronegative patient and donor is a challenge because generating a primary immune response in a dish is extremely hard, feasible but difficult, and we are actively working on that through the CNTRP. And on more clinical grounds, what are the optimal mode of administration or timing of administration so that these cells mediate uh, their uh, effects optimally? So. There was a lot of info here. Hopefully, I was helpful. So it is time for questions. 